Tonight's Torah portion, Vayakel, which roughly translates to, and he assembled. So I have a Hebrew word, <coughs> I have a Hebrew word for us <coughs> tonight, other than Vayakel, which is a statement. The Hebrew word I have for us is a name, <coughs> and it's Betza, Betzalel, Betzalel which is the name of the Israeli of the tribe of Judah that was anointed to build the tabernacle and everything that's in the tabernacle. We'll talk a little bit about him. Now, we're a little bit behind, and so I'm going to abbreviate the message a bit tonight. We do have three points of interest, and I'm going to try and slide through this as quickly as I could. Um, yeah, it's definitely, I got to punch through this quickly. So. Three points of interest. Again, tonight's extra Hebrew word, Hebrew word is Betz Al El. Betz Al El. Betz Al El. I'm looking at the Hebrew here, and that's the best way I can spell it. Betz Al El. All right. Three points of interest. The Shabbat, even for holy work. Bezalel is how we tend to say it because it, in English it's spelled differently. The second point of interest, Bezalel, filled with the Holy Spirit, the gold of the tabernacle and the church. So the first point of interest, I want to move through this as quickly as I could. The Sabbath, even for holy work. So last week's Torah portion, we didn't get into this, but in chapter 31 of Exodus, we saw that God leading up to instructions for the building of the tabernacle, he clearly stated that you must observe the Shabbat. So before he began to give out instructions about the Shabbat, about the building of the tabernacle and everything that's involved, he reminded Israel of the Shabbat. That's in last week's Torah portion. So, last week's Torah portion was, most of it, meant much of it was instructions as to how the tabernacle would be built and by what means. This, this week's Torah portion more relates to the actual beginning of the work. So, he gives out the instructions concerning the work, and then this week's Torah portion is when the work actually begins. And before the work begins, he reminds them a second time about the Shabbat. So, what do you think God is saying? He talks to them about the work that's involved. He tells them about the Sabbath. In other words, you have all this work. I'm going to anoint this particular Israeli, Bezalel, and I'm going to appoint him to do this work. It's going to be, it's going to be supernatural. He's going, to, he's, going to, he's going to receive his anointing, his power, his ability, his knowledge, and everything that, that he needs to carry out this work will come from me. But remember the Shabbat. And then again, in tonight's Torah portion, he does the same thing. So, what is God saying? Even for the work of the tabernacle, remember the Shabbat. Don't think that because you're doing work for the tabernacle, that you can violate the Shabbat. Clearly, that's what he's saying. That's why he brought that into, into light. In both instances, when he begins to talk about the work that needs to be done. Think about the incredible amount of work that would have to go into the building of this tabernacle. So much so that God explicitly anointed, and particularly anointed, one man. And gave him everything he needed, plus filled him with the Holy Spirit so that he can carry out this work. The work that was done on that tabernacle for the space of time that it was done in was strictly, purely, spiritual and miraculous. Yet, God wanted, wanted Israel to know very, very clearly that even though you're doing holy work for the tabernacle, keep the Sabbath. He had already given them, given them the law concerning the Sabbath. He had already spoke to them about the Sabbath. Again, he wanted to be real clear they, that they knew as it relates to the building of the tabernacle that you must remember the Shabbat. Two cases we see. Let's read a little bit. You know, we, we, we don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to try and just read a little bit for us from Exodus chapter 35. I have it marked. Exodus chapter 35. 
This is the Torah portion. This is where it begins. So the bulk of it, I'm talking about 90% of it, is all about the making of the tabernacle and everything that goes in the tabernacle. He says that at the very beginning of the process, then Moses assembled all the congregation of the sons of Israel and said to them, these are the things the Lord has commanded you to do. Build the tabernacle. And then he interjects, for six, for six days work may be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a holy day, a Shabbat of complete rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. God's pretty serious about the Shabbat. But you see, you see how that correlates with the work of the tabernacle. Again, he had already given them the, the commandment to keep the Sabbath. But then, as it relates to the building of the tabernacle, again, he reminds them. So it tells us quite a bit. You know, many, many years ago, there was an effort to move the congregation into, a, into observing the Sabbath by coming together on a Saturday in conjunction with Friday night to have a service on, on Saturdays. I was one of the people who, re, who, who resisted that. And strongly, I resisted it strongly because I knew what it would mean for, the, for those in leadership. They will have no Sabbath. They will have no rest. And I think, I think this is what God is saying. Rest on the Sabbath. You might think doing work in the tabernacle is essential, but it isn't. Not as important as the Shabbat. So to observe the Shabbat. We come together on a Sunday morning, right? And sometimes I have to define that to people. Why do you meet on a Sunday morning? Because we observe the Sabbath. Invariably, what happens to those congregations that feel like they have to have two Shabbat services, what happens is many people end up taking the Sunday as the Sabbath. Because they've got to rest. All you did was work during the Sabbath. Prepare a message. Be involved in praise and worship. That's work. God is saying the work of the tabernacle has to take, 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 take aside when it comes to the Sabbath. It's not as important. So we are that tabernacle, aren't we? We are. The Shabbat is more important than the tabernacle as it relates to observing the Shabbat. So if you feel like, if you, feel like you know, some people do still feel this way like, uh, you know, we have to find a place where we can worship on a Sabbath, on a, on, during, on a Saturday during the day. Keep this in mind. God sees the Sabbath and keeping the Sabbath as essential. Even if you're doing things for this tabernacle, God was very clear about that. Let's talk about Bazalel, this, this anointed person. He was of the tribe of Judah, right? God took him from the tribe of Judah. And what does it say? Let's read what it says here in chapter 35. 30 to 33. I'm trying to move through this as, a little quicker than I normally would. Chapter 35, we're going to read 30 to 33. As it relates to this individual, Bezalel. Then Moses said to the sons of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled them with the Spirit of God. So this Bezalel is filled with the Holy Spirit. And for what purpose? Let's read. In wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in craftsmanship. Now, we know the gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? Wisdom, yes. Understanding, knowledge, yes. Craftsmanship. So God filled Bezalel with the Holy Spirit. And with that, he received wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and craftsmanship. Isn't that amazing? Craftsmanship, of course, for the building of the tabernacle. You get the idea that Bezalel was not necessarily a crafty person. God put his spirit in him and anointed him to carry out this work. To make designs for working, for working in gold and silver and in bronze, and in cutting of stones for settings, and in carving of wood, so, uh, so as to perform in every inventive work. That, that's, that's amazing when you think about it. God anointed this son of Judah for the spirit of inventions. 
and craftsmanship. Again, it denotes that this Bezalel was not necessarily a crafty person. He does call for those who were crafty, who had talent, to also help him. But God anointed this Bezalel specifically for this. And he raised up, he raised up another Israeli to come alongside him from the tribe of Dan. Let's read about him. He also put in his heart to teach. And this, is, this is Bezalel, to teach. Both he and Oholiab, Oholiab, the son of Abish, Ahishamak, Ahishamak, right? Let me read this again. He also put in, the, in his heart to teach. Both he and Oholiab, the son of Ahishamak, of the tribe of Jan, of Dan, mm, Ahishamak. So God anointed this Israeli <clears throat> and gave him all kinds of talents, comes from the Holy Spirit, and to teach, and to teach others in regard, well, one in particular, Ohaliab, was the only one to work with him, which is, which is amazing. Others were involved in the, in the assembling of the tent, but this Bazalel was involved in the actual building of the tabernacle and every artifact that went into it. And when you read the, the entire Torah portion, it's amazing how much Bazalel had to do. And the span of time that's given to him it's believed to be around three months. If you look at the timeline, so this Bezalel, this, this man of Judah, anointed by God, filled with the Holy Spirit, given all kinds of incredible gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we don't see again. We don't see a gift of craftsmanship anywhere in the New Testament of the Holy Spirit. We don't see a gift of invent, inventionship. We don't see that. This, this Israelite, was anointed one of a kind. And God gives him the power and the ability to put together everything relative to the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, table of showbread, everything, the menorah. He did this together with Aholiab. It's an amazing thing. It's a supernatural thing for sure. So God, what, what, what can we extract from this? Is there something for us to extract? I'm trying to move along here, so bear with me. What can we take away from this? That God chose this otherwise obscure, relative, relatively, well, absolutely unknown son of Judah and anointed him, wisdom, knowledge, <laughs> understanding, craftsmanship, the ability to invent. And he commissions him to teach Aholiab, and he and Aholiab did everything with the exception of the curtains of the tabernacle, built everything. Now, I often wonder, what exactly did those furnishings look like? Did they actually look the way that we depict them? Like that, the menorah behind us? I often wonder if they were crude and, and not as attractive as the Second Temple period. Because the Second Temple period, we had all that gold that Herod stole, and all that craftsmanship that Herod had, and he built a wonderful temple with all sorts of wonderful uh, artifacts in them. But what did the first temple, the tabernacle artifacts, look like? I often wondered about that. Well, after studying this today, I, I've come to the conclusion that they were exquisite. They were absolutely exquisite. You know, there's an archaeologist who believes that the Ark of the Covenant is in Ethiopia. And it was taken around certain parts of Africa, and it's basically a huge tub with handles on it and carvings on it, made of wood. No. No. I think the Ark of the Covenant that Bezalel made was exquisite. Unlike anything that existed at the time. And why? Because God put his spirit in Bezalel. And he gave the spirit of a teacher as well in Bezalel, to teach a holy ab, and they too did all that work in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I think everything was exquisitely made. And it's possible that they were more exquisite than what Herod and his team put together for that second temple. For that second temple. I believe they were wonderful. Think about burnished gold. You have to produce burnished gold in the wilderness. You have to take nose rings and earrings 
and all sorts of other rings that we don't want to talk about and fashion all of it into burnish, you know, you know what burnish gold is? It is, so, it is so shiny that it's like a mirror. Think about that. And think about the menorah made of solid gold. You know, the menorah that, that you see depicted sometimes has a bar across the top. You know that? A bar across, what's the purpose of the bar across the top? To hold all that gold together f to prevent it from, from, from swaying. Because that's a lot of gold, a lot of weight. Think about this arm of the, of the menorah. It's a tremendous amount of weight there. And so sometimes you see the menorah depicted with a bar right across the top to hold it together. Well, that's not what Bazalel made. He made a menorah of perfect gold and perhaps the highest gold, 20, 20, 24, 24 carat gold perhaps, because they didn't have the means. It says it, made of pure gold. So this gold was perhaps 24 carat. What do we know about 24 carat gold? It's soft. It's very soft. And it's difficult to fashion into, into jewelry because it's so soft. But this was perfect gold, probably made of 24 karat gold, but it was made in such a way that it stood. God anointed Bezalel to do something that was beyond natural, it was supernatural. It's the only way it could have been done. God did it through Bezalel. Could you imagine Bezalel? He was like, an, he was like you know, you take a movie and you, you fast forward it. He was constantly working. I get the sense that he never rested. He just worked and worked and worked. When you read the Torah portion, I encourage you to read the Torah portion. It seems as if this Bezalel was like, a, he was busy, busy like a bee. He was just putting things together. Him and Oholiab. It's an amazing thing. Let's talk about the tabernacle. Who's going to build the tabernacle? We know Ohaliab, right, and Bezalel built that tabernacle. We know that the tabernacle in the wilderness is exceedingly allegorical. Is that true? I'm talking symbolisms there from start to end. Every piece of furniture in the, tab in the tabernacle points to something way beyond. Allegorical. And we know what the tabernacle represents. The holy place, the ministry of Jesus himself. Every artifact, every furniture in the holy place speaks of the ministry of Messiah. The menorah, right? We know it. The menorah, the light of the world. The table of showbread, the bread of life. The altar of incense, the high priest. Everything pointed to Jesus. So that's a very important space that God has put together. The walls of the tabernacle was furnished with burnished gold, ceiling, and walls. When you walked into the tabernacle, at any point, the menorah is lit. What did you see? Nothing but gold. And I, I venture to say that you may have barely recognized the artifacts because the light from the menorah glistening off that wall would have illuminated that entire space as you walked into it. All of it symbolic, all of it meaningful. All of it relevant to who we are. Because we are that living tabernacle. I'm taking shortcuts, but we'll get to where I want to get. All of us, we're all, this church, this body of believers, we are that living tabernacle. And that space, that tabernacle that was built by, by Bazalel and Ohalia by the anointing of God is who we are. Symbolic, but it's who we are. So, concerning Bazalel, who is the builder of this tabernacle, anointed, filled with the Holy Spirit. Who is he pointing to? If, if this is all symbolic, and it is, allegorical pictures are throughout the Torah. I mean, they're just, the Torah is brimming with allegorical pictures, very important allegorical pictures. Who is Bazael a type of? Who builds this tabernacle? Who is anointed? to build this tabernacle, Jesus only. He is the one that builds the tabernacle. Is that true? He is the one that builds the tabernacle. Bazalel is a type of Yeshua. He is. Let me read for you. Let's go to, let's go to, uh, 
Let's go to Zechariah. I was thinking of going somewhere else first. Let's go to Zechariah. Yes, Bezalel is a type of Yeshua. Zechariah chapter 6. And we'll talk about how relevant that is. <laughs> Did I mark this and I'm jumping around? Yes. Zechariah chapter 6. Let's talk about who builds the temple of God. Are you the temple of God? In an allegorical sense, are you? Did God come and dwell, Shakan, in the midst of us tonight? Yes, he did. He did come and dwell in the midst of us tonight. Did he come into the holy place? Did we come into the holy place? Into Yeshua, yes. We came into Yeshua. And the curtains are rent. And we entered into that holy of holies as we worship. That's, that's the approach. You are that temple. Didn't Paul, didn't Peter refer to you as a temple? That you are being built up into a spiritual house, a spiritual temple, where you offer up praises to God. You're living stones in that temple. Isn't that what Peter said? It's absolutely true. So now, Zechariah, speaking concerning the Zemach, who is the Zemach? Yeshua is the Zemach. Is that true? The branch, referred to as the branch. There are two words for branch in Hebrew, Natsur and Zemach. They both refer to Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, we see the Natsur. It's a reference to Jesus. The angel, Gabriel, speaking to Mary, said that this, the Natsur, he will be the Natsur. And then we see another reference concerning the branch, which is Zemach. What's the confusion there? Is there confusion there? Uh, perhaps. But let me clear it up for you. A zemach, which is a shoot, right? That's what a, a zemach is. A shoot becomes a branch, doesn't it? And that's the point. Yeshua is referred to as the Natsur. He's also referred to as the zemach. Every branch comes from a zemach, an offshoot. And so that's the, that's the reality of who Jesus is. He is the branch. He is the Zemach. He is also the Netzer. So let's read concerning who will build this temple. Remember that God made a promise to King David that he would build the temple. Is that true? David said, let me build a temple for you. Let me build a house for you, God. And God said, no. You're a man of war. Your hands are filthy with blood. I will build you a temple. And then he says in the same breath, your son will build you a temple. Is there confusion there? Perhaps. But that's what he said. I will build you a temple. Your son, your descendant, the word is Zerah, your descendant after you, he will build you the house. So what is God saying? I will build you, I will build you the house. Your Zerah, your seed, will build you the house. What is God saying? That your son will build a house for me. God is speaking to David. Who is the son of David? Who is the Zerah? Who is the seed of David? The offshoot. That's the point. The Zemach. That becomes the branch. So let's read here in Zechariah chapter 6, 12 to 13. Then say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold a man whose, whose name is Zemach, branch, for he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord. So we see there are two references to the Zemach building the temple of the Lord. When you see two references like that, one after the next, what is, what is the Bible telling us? It's there for emphasis, right? He wants us to hear this. This man, the Zemach, who is the son of David, the one that will build the temple? It is he that will build the temple. Yes, it says, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus he will be a priest on his, on his throne, and the council of peace will be between two offices. So the Zemach, Yeshua, is the one who builds the temple. 
God has specifically appointed his son, Yeshua, and I would venture to say anointed his son. What did Jesus receive on the Yadan, on the Jordan? The Holy Spirit. And what did he begin to do right then? He began to put together his assembly. Didn't he? He went out to preach the message of the kingdom of God and to carry the signs and wonders that go with the message, but he selected his disciples, those who would be the foundation stones of this building, of this temple that he has began to build. Jesus is the builder. And Bezalel is a picture of Jesus. And God wants us to know that this temple is only put together in a supernatural way. It's not a natural structure. It's not something that we ourselves can do. Note, only Bazalel and Ohaliab were the ones to work in that temple. Now what did it say? God filled Bazalel with his Holy Spirit and gave him all the abilities and beyond. And he began to teach Ohaliab who worked with him. What does the word Bazalel mean? I didn't give you the meaning when we talked about it just now. The word Bezalel means in his shadow. In God's shadow. Bezalel. In God's shadow. So this Bezalel, who built the temple in God's shadow, in God's anointed, is a type of Jesus. Now, I know there's a whole Trinitarian conundrum that trips us up. Right? Jesus is God, so what are you talking about? He builds the temple for God. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. It is Jesus, Yeshua, the Zemach, that builds the temple for God. This temple that we are, Jesus has put us together for God, so that God would have a place where he would be worshipped in Jesus, in Yeshua. He is the one, he is the builder. He is also the chief cornerstone. Is that true? Paul referred to him as the chief cornerstone. That's absolutely true. He is also a precious stone. Peter said that. A precious stone. Rejected by men, but precious in the sight of God. That's what Peter said about Jesus in 2 Peter. But Paul referred to Jesus as the cornerstone. Let's go look at that. Now, these, these things are... These things can be troubling to some of us. If you're indelibly connected to Trinitarian doctrine, you stumble with these things. What do you mean Jesus building separate, different, not the Father himself? That's what I'm saying. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I know we're stuck sometimes on this co-equality, consubstantiation. I know it, it plagues Christianity. Ever since it was invented, ever since it was invented at that council somewhere in the 5th century, we've been, we've been plagued with that idea of consubstantiation, co-equality. It has caused many people to scratch their heads and drink some coffee or something. Because you can't figure it out. What do you mean? Consubstantial, co-equal. All right, that's like consubstantiation. What's consubstantiation? Think about this watch. It's a citizen's, what is it, uh, something, eco, I can hardly see, eco dive, divers, two, two, 200 meters, this watch. If I had two other watches identical to this, with the same wear and tear on it, with the same stains, the same scuffs, I would have three consubstantiated watches. That's what the word consubstantial, same, identical. Is that the relationship we see in the Bible concerning the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? It's not. Jesus was given the work of redemption and appointed to build this tabernacle by God. And he's doing it for God. Isn't that what we just read in Zechariah? He is the builder, brothers and sisters. And you are the fabric. You are the material of this tabernacle. 
When, Baz, when Bazalel was anointed and appointed, everyone brought their gold, and he took all of their nose rings, their toe rings, their finger rings, and what rings, and whatever, and he took all of that stuff, and he fashioned out of it a perfect tabernacle. See, that's who we are. We're all that gold and stuff that, 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 that was used for all the wrong reasons that God has taken, given to his son, to fashion into the, the most exquisite furnishings. That's who we are. We are the fabric in this tab. We are the material of this tabernacle. And we're valuable. I want you to ponder that for a moment. We're valuable. El Bezalel took gold that must have looked as ugly as gold can possibly look. Hanging on the noses of people, on the air of people. And he made something exquisite out of it. That's what Jesus is doing with us. He's making us into an exquisite dwelling place for God. And we will not define these pieces of gold out there. I know speaking for myself, I probably look like a piece of stone. But do it all over me. When Jesus found me, I looked like a clump of rock. That's what I looked like. I was just about as hard as a clump of rock. Mired with dirt and muck and other things that I won't mention. And he took me and he put me through a refining process. And from this clump of rock and other things, he's brought about exquisite gold. And he's put me together with you. And he's causing us to be that living temple where God would dwell in the midst of us. Tonight we had that. Our worship was exquisite. Our praise, our approach was powerful. You see? Who did this? Jesus put us together. He snapped us together. He, he, he said, it's time to worship. It's time to get into my presence. Your gold, I'm going to fasten you together. I'm going to build you quickly like Bezalel built that tabernacle. It's a supernatural thing that occurred here today. It wasn't natural. None of us could reproduce such a thing. God did that, and he appointed his son to do it so that we can come into his presence and this tabernacle could exist as it existed in the wilderness only. This one is the real deal. What was in the tabernacle only pointed to this. What was in the wilderness only pointed to this. And you need to see this. In Ephesians. Now in regards to Bezalel. Bezalel had a helper. Who was Oholiab. Someone quickly do your phone thing. Look up what the word Oholiab means. I should have looked it up. What does the word, the name Oholiab mean? We know what Bezalel means. In God's shadow. All right? Ohaliab. Look at that for us. So who would Ohaliab be? There are no mistakes in the Bible. An allegorical picture is designed in a certain way to reflect something that God is saying. So Bezalel, he's a type of Messiah Jesus. He points to the miraculous building of this tabernacle. Who is Ohaliab? And what does Ohaliab mean? Father's tent? <laughs> so powerful. I did look it up today. I just remember that. Father's tent. Whose tent is this? Whose tabernacle is this? I want to tell you that Ohaliab fits into the typology. And we are Ohaliab. Each of us, we are Ohaliab. Bezalel has, has been appointed by God, anointed by God to teach Ohaliab. So that Ohaliah would work with him in the building of this tabernacle. Each of us. And I'm not just saying each of us necessarily. But those of us who has taken it upon ourselves to work in this tabernacle. To be a, a, a builder in this tabernacle. You are Ohaliab. And Jesus is teaching you how to build this tabernacle. I'm talking to leaders now. Those of us who build in this tabernacle, you pray for each other, you burden yourselves for each other, you minister from the Holy Spirit, you teach 
from the Holy Spirit. You are Ohaliab and you're being taught by Yeshua in regards to the building of this tabernacle. This is a clear picture that we all need to see. This tabernacle means everything to God. How many places on Red Bug Lake Road tonight at 7.30 until we concluded our praise and worship, how many places did exactly what we did here on Red Bug Lake Road tonight? When we came in as, crust, as, as, as rusted, crusted stones and we became gold furnishings as we surrendered to God. How many places, that, how many places on Red Bug Lake Road that this happened in? Tonight. How many places in Orlando that this happened in tonight? Be honest. Don't be an ecumen ecumenicalist. Did this happen anywhere? <laughs> it happened here. Why did it happen here? Because God appointed Bezalel, who is Yeshua, to snap you together, to pull you together, to bring you in, to cause you to shine, to be that tabernacle. We are the ones who consist of the tabernacle, but some of us are builders, Ohaliab, in this tabernacle. I want to read for you what Paul says about this tabernacle. I want to go back to, to, to Ephesians chapter 2. Concerning this tabernacle, where should I begin? Verse 19, Ephesians chapter 2. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, Messiah Yeshua himself being... The cornerstone, what does the cornerstone do in a building? Holds it together. The strength of the building has to do with that cornerstone, doesn't it? In whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. In whom you are being built together in a dwelling place, in, the dwelling, in a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So you are that dwelling place. God is putting you together. He's fitting you. He's building you. But he's doing it through his son, Yeshua. Now, with that, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to read verse 11 and on. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipment of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Messiah. Until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Messiah. Ohaliab is who is being mentioned here. The ones who will build alongside him in this temple. Apostles, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and prophets for the equipment of the saints to, to build you up into this living temple, this holy temple. That's who Ohaliab is, my father's tent. Is this our father's tent? Is it? When I, when I prepare myself for a message of, of a praise and worship, when I prepare myself in general, I'm doing it for, the fathers, for our Father's tent. That's why I do it. And those of you who will truly embrace your position in leadership and not just take a position because you're paid to do it, Or come and stand here because it's what you do. But those of you who truly commit yourself to the building up of this tent, this is your father's tent. And you are Ohaliab. Now, in years to come, there, there is going to be more 
more need for leadership. Ohaliab has to form further in the context of the congregation. It's incumbent upon each of us to work ourselves into that position where our Father's tent is everything to us. We live for it, we work for it. And who's teaching us? Well, Bezalel is teaching us. He is anointed. Who, by, by the way, it's amazing. It's, it's amazing that it says there in the Torah that this Bezalel was filled with the Holy Spirit. Do we see that anywhere else in the Torah? That a person was filled with the Holy Spirit. In the Torah? No. It is the first time we see anything like this. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit before any believer in him was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit to carry out the work of ministry. Is that true? It's absolutely true. Who anoints in the Holy Spirit? Who baptizes in the Holy Spirit? Jesus. And I want to tell you this. The anointing, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's all connected to this tent. He didn't baptize us in the Holy Spirit so we can go off and become prophets or evangelists, wander from one place to the next, make a living in the anointing. He anointed us to be factored into a tent. Oh, Haliab, my father's tent, so that we can function in that tent. Leadership is about being oh, Haliab because we're building. We're putting together. Those of you that are deacons, and there are many deacons, what's a deacon? A servant. A minister, right? That's a deacon. We have many deacons here who are not recognized as deacons. The time will come soon enough when I'll recognize deacons. And yes, there will be some deaconess. What's a deaconess? Uh, a lady deacon? Yes, I'm going to do that. Some of you might, might resist me, but I'm going to call you up anyway. Pat Murphy. I'm going to recognize you anyway. Because you are working to be Ohaliab. You're working to build this tent. And your help comes from Jesus. He anoints you to do it. He's the one, he's the only one that can anoint you to do it. The time will also come when we'll have to recognize elders. That, that's coming. Not sure who they are. But you're going to have to prove yourself. You're going to have to prove that you are Ohaliab. And your concern truly is this tent. Another position. Not an appointment. Not a recognition. But your concern is the tent. That has to be proven. And you'll be recognized. You see, God is looking for Ohaliabs in each of us. We have to, we have to press in for it. Do you want to be Ohaliab? Do you want to work alongside Bazalel in the building of this tent, his father's tent? You should want it. Because it's a wonderful thing that God is doing. Now, now just to wrap this up, actually I ended up taking just as much time. Almost. Almost. Let's talk about this tabernacle, what it looked like. Again, we mentioned it earlier. It glistened with gold. Now, the tabernacle in the wilderness <laughs> is a type of the New Jerusalem. Is that a bug? Maybe. The tabernacle in the wilderness is a type of the New Jerusalem. Is that true? It points to it, right? What do we know about the, the New Jerusalem? Its city had streets of gold. The walls of the city that were 74 inches, 74 yards wide, 74 yards wide, was made of translucent gold. How many of us have seen translucent gold? Not one of us. This city was exquisite. It was perfect. It is. The picture that John gives us is a perfect picture of all gold and, and, and different colors and, and, and pearls and precious stones. It's a precious place. <laughs> 
That's who we are, brothers and sisters. I want to tell you that again. I told you just now. We are precious. We are uh, uh, chosen by God. Precious. Like the gold that was burnished for the walls of the tabernacle, like the gold that was fashioned into the menorah, into the table of showbread, into the altar of incense, you are precious and exquisitely made. That menorah made by Bazael was exquisitely made. No man could have made that to where it would stand with 24 karat gold. It would just collapse. God did that. You are exquisitely chosen and exquisitely made to be this living tabernacle. And with that, I want to read for you and bring this to an end. What Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Five, and come into him, Yeshua, that's who we're referring to, and come into him as a living stone which has been rejected by man but is choice and precious and exquisite in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, precious, exquisite, are being built up into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Bezalel, Messiah Jesus. God is telling us a lot. And we need to listen to what he's saying. This is not a, a construct put together by man. The Holy Spirit working in the builder of this construct has put this together. Human efforts will do nothing but wreck it. Anything, and I mean anything that we do in this living tabernacle has to be done in the spirit. Everything we do has to be done in the spirit, the Holy Spirit. This is not a natural construct. Our conventional wisdom will do nothing but interfere with this construct. Everything we do must be grounded in the Spirit of God because Bezalel was filled with the Holy Spirit. The very first time we see anything like that in all of the Bible, Bezalel was filled with the Spirit of God. And he put this exquisite tabernacle together. And that's who we are. Surrender to God. See yourself as divinely appointed. Apply yourself, be holy, see yourself as precious, because that's how God sees you. Hated by men, but precious. Rejected by men, but precious in the sight of God. You are being built up into this holy temple, living stones. So, Father God, we thank you, Lord, for appointing us in your Son, Yeshua. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit, that you've put within us. Father, we see ourselves as coming alongside your Son in the building of this tabernacle. And yes, God, this is our Father's tent. And we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to work in this tent. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come before you in this tent and worship you and honor you. Father God, may we always come before you with humility and with surrendered hearts, that your name would be glorified and that you would be magnified in this place, Lord. Sanctify this house even more so. Make this house even more a place for your glory and shakan in the midst of us. May your shakina glory be known in us, O Father God. We thank you, Lord, and we bless you in your Son, Yeshua, our Lord and our God. Amen.